Julia, thank you so much for um, joining me today and coming on to Hey Legal to tell us all about the Scottish Solicitors Bar Association. Um, we'll start right at the very start. Um, can you tell me why the SSBA was set up, please? Yes. Well, thank you very much for having me. Um, well, the, there's lots of reasons. Um, the idea of having a national bar association is not new. That's been around for a long time. Um, and people in the past have tried to set it up so that we can organise ourselves nationally um, in response in particular to the underfunding of legal aid, um, but also to make sure that defence agents are um, are heard um, and their voices are, are, are heard. Um, but why now, I suppose, is probably... Um, the question um, and I think the pandemic is probably a large part of that because that's thrown into really sharp focus problems with underfunding of legal aid but also um, about representation of the defence in discussions about um, how we move forward through, um, through these difficulties um, because it's going to be a long time I think before we're back to normal um, but it's also thrown up a lot of problems because we've not been able to work in the way that we that we normally do. There's a huge reduction in business at courts and we have to make sure that firms are able to weather that storm so that we're still around to tackle the backlog which we, which is building. Um, and now the other side of that is that um, we've all become a lot more used to using Zoom like this and um, WhatsApp and uh, other technology. So in a way, there's more focus, but it's also easier for us to do it now. Um, and, and we've taken advantage of, of, of things like Twitter and stuff to, to uh, promote ourselves. So I think that combination of factors makes now a really good time uh, for the launch of the SSBA. Absolutely. Um, yeah, you can utilise all forms of modern communication and try to, to create a unified body and you know, going forward obviously that can make quite a significant difference. Um, so can you tell our viewers just a little bit more about you, yourself, your background and how you um, became the uh, president? <laughs> I'm still asking myself that. Um, <laughs> um, well, uh, so I'm a criminal defence practitioner uh, working in Edinburgh um, and I was, for the last two years, I was uh, president of the Edinburgh Bar Association. And prior to that, I was involved um, with their criminal subcommittee group. Um, and you know, so I've always been interested in, in getting involved. Um, I'm not one for sitting around moaning about it, if there's something you can do about it. Um, and during my time, particularly last year during the pandemic, um, uh, my time as EBA president, worked quite closely with um, some of the other faculty heads, uh, particularly um, Glasgow and Aberdeen, um, and, and laterally Hamilton as well. And um, we essentially got a WhatsApp group together to try and like facilitate communication um, across the country. And that I think, culminated with the action that we took on St Andrew's Day, where we boycotted um, the custody court and uh, I was very pleased that Glasgow joined in with that um, and, and we had other there were other smaller faculties that did as well but there were quite a lot of people that didn't know uh, what we were doing and had said that they would have joined in had they known um, so we started this inter-faculty group so that we could just aid that communication and I suppose it all led from there because um, there was lots of talk about how it would be good to have a national body and a group of us decided to just go for it um, and, and go about setting it up um, and, uh, and uh, from that group I was nominated as president so okay. um, so that that's where we are but it, it came about from sort of more informal communication um, between some of the bigger bars um, and a desire to to, to spread that out across the country. Okay, perfect. And in terms of the arrangements that are in place currently with you being president and um, the existence of a committee, is that now, are these permanent um, appointments or are there to be elections? 
No, we will have elections in due course. Um, I mean, we obviously had to we had to get an interim committee just to get things off the ground. Um, and our constitution is set up so that the committee is 12 people, um, two from each of the sheriffdoms across Scotland. So um, the hope is that that ensures that, that we've got a good spread of representation. And um, a few of the people on the committee are faculty heads in their own regions. Um, others are people who've been nominated in, in place of the faculty head, so like myself. Um, I, I mean, I imagine that that will be the people standing for election when it comes to it. Yeah. Um, but um, it's very much um, we had to just get this group of people together um, in the first place to get the ball rolling. But but we've got a lot of um, experience on the committee, um, uh, and that that's been really helpful. Um, so, I, I, I mean, I, I don't know. I think you'll probably still see us hanging about for a while yet. Yeah, I'm sure. Absolutely. Um, so, obviously, I've been following your Twitter uh, output closely, and I know that you've already had meetings and been involved in, yeah. in trying to progress your aims. So, can you just tell um, uh, the viewers, wh what are the immediate priorities of the SSBA and how do you plan to progress uh, those priorities? Sure. So, um, very immediate concern for us um, is funding to get through the uh, to get through the pandemic and the loss of business that we've suffered. So, at the moment, primarily that is the resilience fund, um, and uh, alongside that, you've got the traineeship fund as well. Um, and um, I, I'm going to be present at a meeting next week, uh, along with uh, some other faculty heads. Uh, with um, the Scottish Government um, because they are looking at reviewing the Resilience Fund. You'll be aware that it, it's, it's really not done its job in terms of uh, distributing the fund. Um, so in the first place, you know, we've got we've got a voice at that table um, and depending, you know, if we don't get a result from that, which I, um, I suspect might be the case, um, then we will go on to campaign um, Justice Minister, whoever that will be after the election, yeah. um, and to try and keep the profile of that issue um, uh, at the forefront uh, of people's minds, but particularly the forefront of the Justice Minister's mind. Um, this is this is. Uh, I mean, the Resilience Fund is essentially an emergency fund. So, so the fact that they've um, failed to distribute it and we're still waiting for that is really quite disappointing. And um, but that that's very urgent at the moment yeah. but I think we were quite surprised pleasantly surprised by the amount of interest we had um, from students who wanted to join and we are we, we do have student members um, and I think that feeds into some of the issues with the traineeship fund and um, because there's a lot of people out there who are you know, really bright really able who would like to be doing um, not just criminal work but legal aid work in general it's still despite the problems of profession that people are interested in and you know, people will be passionate about. But um, there aren't the places there for for new talent to go to and, and many firms just can't afford to take on new people as much as they'd like to. So um, the traineeship fund is also a big issue. We want to promote the future of the profession and we want the profession to remain healthy and vibrant. Um, I mean, leading on from that, we also have the issue of retaining staff because um, we, particularly in Edinburgh, we've seen a lot of young people uh, leave to go to, uh, for example, the Child Abuse Inquiry, Procurator Fiscal's Office. And these are all um, you know, public sector organisations. So these are, these are not people that are chasing big bucks. They just want to you know, be able to afford... To, I don't know, buy a home or to have a pension or maternity leave. Um, so it, it's important that firms are are in a position to retain uh, new staff as well as attracting new people into the profession. So I, I, I mean, that for me, I'm, I'm quite passionate about that in particular um, because there's no good getting people in and then for them to work a few years and then just leave because because private firms just can't compete. Um, yeah, absolutely. We were 
chatting just before we started to record about the tremendous disconnect that's going on just now currently, which is that we have you know, the need for a system clearly where everything's uh, resourced and funded and viable. And the, um, the criminal defence bar plays a vital role in the administration of justice. But we have this scenario where we've got masses of, of graduates who are very keen to, be, to commence work in, in this area. We've got a really significant backlog in terms of cases, both summary and solemn, people on remand for very lengthy periods. Um, but a situation where the firms themselves, because of remuneration rates, fundamentally aren't able to take or A, consider taking on trainees. Uh, and then once that step is made, and I appreciate there have been some attempts to try to, to fund some additional places, but once that then happens, the firms then lose have the prospect of it seems a real you know um, departure of talent from their firms because they're just more attractive, um, you know, work elsewhere, better terms and conditions. As you pointed out, it's a real, it's a really yeah. difficult situation. It's quite sad because um, um, when I was president of the EBA. Um, one of our committee members was tasked with um, getting in touch with people who'd left within the last five years or so and asking them um, anonymously um, to sort of give their reasons for leaving. And a, a lot of people said they loved the job, best job they'd had, they really cared about it, but they, they couldn't necessarily afford to, to stay, um, particularly if you want to have a family. Um, a, 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 and for some of the younger ones, it was things like you know, being able to get a deposit for a flat and actually save some money. Um, when the margins are so tight in, in criminal defence, that that wasn't possible. Um, but it was sad to hear that they were leaving a job that they did like. So they weren't yeah. going because they didn't want to do it. it. You know, you have other things going on in your life and, you, you know, you have to take a decision as to what to prioritise. Um, I would like it to... That, that wasn't the case so that people could carry on um, and achieve all those other things in their lives. Yeah, I think it also becomes more difficult as, you know, I'm thinking back, you know, maybe not so long ago, there was when there's more solicitors in a, a, a practice, then it means you can share out, you know, the extra, the, the you know, the, the, the custody visits at the weekend, nighttime visits. But as the numbers dwindle, it falls to, to you virtually all the time to be the person that deals with that. And so you've got the day job and then you've got all the evenings and weekends and, and, and all the administration and everything, which just means that thereafter, when you see the prospect of structured work with you know, a particular regulated hours and overtime and, and flexi time and whatever it will be, that that mm -hmm. tends to happen. So I suppose the challenge is finding solutions around that, which is something that government's going to have to be tasked about because... You know, we can obviously identify the, the issues. It's there after now moving it on and identifying practical ways that it can actually be resolved. Yeah, well, I think this is a really difficult area because, um, you know, there are, there are people within the Legal Aid Board who are very keen on contracting and who would say that that is a solution. You would have sort of bigger firms as kind of economies of scale. Um, it's not a popular um proposition with the profession I think there's a feeling that it would take away a lot of our independence and autonomy which is also important so you're right there is a balance um, and um, it, it's that's something that's difficult to, to find but at the moment um, because legal aid rates are poor you're having to work longer and harder in order to, um, to make ends meet and I think for most people, the view is that if the remuneration was a bit better, then people wouldn't necessarily have to do overtime, yeah. that kind of thing. And also that, you know, firms could offer um, could offer decent pension packages or you know, maternity leave or whatever it was um, that they would that would be a more attractive package. So I think for the I think. For most of the profession, we think that we could do that with with better funding without having to resort to something like contracting, because it's really important as well. 
um, to to keep that independence. Um, I mean, that's a cornerstone of our of our justice system. Um, but but um, the now I'm getting the name right. The fee the payment review panel um, or the fee review panel um, is due to report soon. Um, now they were meeting for almost a year prior to lockdown, and then it just completely stopped for a period. Um, and they had their final meeting recently. Um, but that will look at ways of restructuring um, the way that the way that we're paid. Um, and to my mind, that doesn't necessarily have to involve something like contracting. It, it could be you know, simplifying the existing system, which is you know is a bit piecemeal, I have to say. But um, so we're waiting for them. Although um, as far as I understand it, they are going to be asking for more evidence, which is another kind of frustration for us. Um, and that's a bit of a common theme is is the frustration at how long everything takes to move forward. Um, and that's quite a different sort of culture um, from what we're used to working in. Um, in private practice, you've got to get things done quickly, efficiently. Um, so when you're faced with um, all the sort of bureaucratic procedures of government, um, that can be quite difficult to take. Yeah, I think that's tremendously challenging because it is just the reality. There's a private sector smaller entities, you know, agile decision making, you're, you get mm -hmm. used to that and also your needs are immediate. This is not a long term project. These issues are very live right now mm -hmm. and need some form of resolution to be addressed. And the idea of it being, you know, kicked down the road or an, um, an X number of more months to consider this, that and whatever. And I appreciate we don't want to rush to um, flood solutions, you know, or recommendations, but equally, We've got to take cognizance of what's actually going on. Firms are under pressure, mm -hmm. system is creaking. It does need something to be done uh, within a pretty short time frame. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, one of our aims, um, obviously, is to put pressure on government to, to speed things up um, because we need it now. We need it now. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, that probably leads me on nicely to your uh, next question, which is. Uh, what are the longer terms of the SSBA now? I appreciate I'm asking you that right as you get, as you get to the start line, really. But, give you us know, a chance. But. Yeah, give you a chance, absolutely. But um, you know, clearly you want to have an idea of what success would look like. So do you yeah. know roughly what that would be? Well, I, I mean, longer term, I suppose, I mean, our overall aim is that we want to have a, a seat at the table in discussions, that we want... Um, we want to make sure that the defence um, are consulted um, before decisions are made, because at the moment it often feels like we are the afterthought. Um, certainly with the, the fee review panel, um, I know that myself and other faculty heads had offered to go and give evidence and we were told, no, we'll issue the report first. And to me, that's the wrong way around. We should be involved in the initial process. Yeah. Um, so that, that's where we want to be. We want to be included in all of these discussions. Um, we want also to um, eventually expand to include civil uh, practitioners as well. But at the moment, we're focusing on criminal till till we find our feet, we're up and running, um, and hopefully we can prove ourselves in that uh, realm uh, before moving on to do civil as well. But it's about making sure that we're heard above all. Yeah. And I know, obviously, oh, sorry, sorry. yeah. I, I mean, I know we have um, the law society um, who represent our interests as well. We want to work with them um, because they have certain constraints on them that we don't have, um, and we are able to sort of focus a bit more um, on well, at the moment on criminal defence, um, whereas law society obviously has a lot of other uh, yeah. interests to look after. So. Um, that's where we want to be a permanent fixture, I think. Yeah, no, that, sound, that sounds good. And tell me this, that how will the SSBA interact with the local bar associations? Because one issue that might come up is in relation to unity. You know, in the yeah. past, I've talked about whether it's going to be industrial action, you know, in relation to, to whatever the issue of the day is. And there hasn't necessarily been unity. And I appreciate modern communication might help to unify 
people because they yeah. understand what's been proposed. But can you just tell me how that would work and how you hope to make sure that it's a unified um, a position that you're able to uh, put across? So we've, I suppose we're in a sort of umbrella under which um, the local uh, faculties will feed into. Um, and as I, I say, um, there are a few faculty heads uh, on the committee. Um, a lot of it is to do with um, communication. So if, for example, Edinburgh decides that they want to hold a boycott, then we can help facilitate letting other faculties know about that. Because um, ultimately, when it comes to action, it will be down to the local groups to decide whether or not to do that. But we can facilitate um, the local faculties letting each other know what they're thinking um, and facilitate discussion on whether people want to join in with that. But I don't, I don't think that um, unity necessarily has to mean everybody doing the exact same thing. Um, appreciate that some forms of action may be effective in some courts, but not so much in others. So um, unity could mean, for example, if the larger bars decided to take action, that smaller bars could, um, could put out press um, supportive of it, even if they're not in a position to join in. Um, so I appreciate this is quite a difficult thing as well to get everybody on board yeah. um, and identifying what would be appropriate. And we're constrained by, by rules as well. Um, but if we can facilitate um, you know, one faculty letting another faculty know what they're doing, then that, yeah. that already is part of the, the mission. And, and we, we've seen that um, <clears throat> with um, like the St Andrew's Day action, it wasn't everybody across the country, but I think when you get you know, Edinburgh and Glasgow are two of the bigger bar associations involved. I think it makes people sit up and think. Um, I know there was a lot of work um, uh, ongoing from the Law Society, but it was the point of that boycott that we got a meeting with Hamza Yousaf, and shortly afterwards we got the um, commitment to the 10% increase over two years which I know is not enough, but it's a start. So I think that shows that that action was effective. Yeah. Well, it's got to get attention. If, if it gets attention in the press or whatever it will be, then it gets on the agenda. And if it's on the agenda and you're around the table, then you've got the chance to start to make, you know, strides mm -hmm. forward, hopefully. So yeah. um, that, all, that all sounds good. Um, well, I'm sure this, well, I hope it has served... Um, uh, as a good vehicle for people to find out more about the SSBA. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know you've got lots of plans to build things out, you know, website and more communications. Yeah. And things. Um, is there anything else you would like to cover or say about the SSBA that I haven't well, mentioned? I think, um, in a very sort of shameless plug, um, I think that um, it, it's probably important for people to know that we took the decision to make membership free for the first year. Um, we're funded by donations from some of the larger uh, bar associations, so we have their endorsement, their support. Um, but I completely appreciate that we are a new organisation and people have yet to see what we can do. So um, membership is free to allow you to join up uh, and, and decide you know, whether or not you think it's effective. Um, so... Um, that, I think, is probably one of our biggest selling points at the moment. Um, but, but I'd certainly encourage people to join and see what's happening. Um, and, and we're open to feedback from people across the country. Yeah, no, that sounds great. I think everyone should join up and stay part of the discussion. And obviously, in Hay Legal, we'll continue to, to cover and amplify your message so that um, people can get to know what it is that you're, you're doing. Um, I should have checked with you before we started to um, record because I had suggested a final question, was, which yes. was, what's, what's the best piece of advice you've ever received? Um, so do you have an answer to that, um, Julia? Well, gosh, well, this is, <laughs> you know, this is quite a hard one because, like, um, I can think of, you know, lots of advice as a practitioner that you get, which really the more simple it is, the better it is. Things like taking your time and not being afraid to ask for a moment also things like watching other people who you 
think are good or admire and because you'll always pick up you, you know tips from them and, and things that, that that you can bring to your own um to your own advocacy um and the, I was sort of struck by the worst piece of advice I'd ever been given um which was from a friend prior to my first jury speech and everybody will tell you that you need to you know pause remember to slow down and then she suggested that the way forward was to, to pause, take a drink of water midway through it, which is which is great. But, but I was shaking so badly that it comes <laughs> up like this. And I managed to hit my own glasses, put it down without having taken a drink. So if I have any advice for anybody, is if you're nervous, hold on to the lectern and don't make a pass. That's very wise, very sage advice, I'm sure. <laughs> Hopefully all these new trainees and entrants to the profession will, will, will listen and learn from that. <laughs> um, so brilliant. Well, listen, thank you so much for your time. I know you're very busy. I know there's thank lots you. going on uh, in your own practice and obviously with all the work you've now taken on with SSBA. Hard on the heels of being the Edinburgh Bar Association president as well. So you're obviously a glutton for punishment <laughs> uh, with everything. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much for having me. Well, thank you. Thank you.